Did I really change it? <laughs> OK. Yeah, more or less. Uh, yeah, anyway, the title now is this one. So thank you for, uh, for the invitation, first of all. I'm, I'm going to speak about this project I have with uh, Oliver Fabert. And uh, yeah, basically what we want to do is uh, introducing uh, um, gravitational descendants in these uh, kind of uh, symplectic uh, extensions uh, of uh, Gromov-Witten theory, uh, in particular where the target is non-compact. And uh, in particular, uh, today I'm going to focus uh, on uh, uh, contact homology, which is quite a bit less than symplectic field theory that we heard uh, uh, from, uh, from uh, Jean Yves. OK, so uh, well why? why? Because the, the main motivation is, uh, is actually that uh, in, uh, in Gromov-Witten theory, you know, these descendants are basically uh, uh, the extra information that you need to make the algebraic structure rich enough to reconstruct uh, the higher genus invariants, basically. And, uh, and this helps a lot because uh, you have to compute just a, like a minimum number of invariants uh, from scratch, from the geometry, and then you use this uh, uh, nice algebraic picture, you know, that there's many versions of, of it, like given tells cone or uh, like these uh, Dubrovian's integrable systems. And, uh, and with this, you compute the rest of the invariants, okay? Uh, and sympathetic field theory, Mm, is more general, uh, in a sense that uh, I will tell you in a moment. Uh, but in the end, it also gives rise to Hamiltonian systems somehow, like uh, Gromov-Witten theory gives rise to uh, integrable systems. And we don't know anything about these Hamiltonian systems in, uh, in sympathetic field theory. We just know that they are Hamiltonian and that they have a lot of symmetry, but uh, not if they are integrable, for instance. And integrability would, in, on the geometric point of view, would, uh, would mean that uh, you can uh, use this uh, equation to compute the invariance without getting your hands dirty with geometry di directly with the moduli spaces. So the idea is to plug descendants into this theory and see if we can get enough algebraic structure. OK, so enough with the blah, blah. Let me. <laughs> Start with a small reminder about contact homology. OK, mm, as you can imagine, you start with a contact manifold. And uh, so lambda is a one form, and uh, it's maximally non integrable. And uh, OK, here n is, uh, I mean, 2n plus 1 is the dimension of the closed manifold V. And uh, on a contact manifold, when you have a contact one form, uh, you can also mm, define the uniquely the uh, rep vector field. It's a vector field on the manifold that is um, it generates the kernel of uh, d lambda. By this, by this d, uh, d lambda becomes a contact uh, a symplectic form on uh, on the bundle sub-bundle of the uh, tangent bundle, which is given just by the kernel of lambda. So d lambda is a symplectic form here. And you have the red vector field that generates the direction where, you know, the complementary direction, the direction where this d lambda degenerates. So this is. And uh, you normalize it to be just, uh, how to say, dual to, to lambda. OK. And uh, yes. So what you do next is you want to consider uh, a symplectic manifold that is non-compact, that is given by the cylinder V times R. And you put a common uh, symplectic form that maybe, uh, let me call this om big omega. And uh, a symplectic form, omega, is given just by d e to the t lambda, where t is this vertical direction here. This is v, of course. And um, 
yeah, then you put a, uh, an almost complex structure that is compatible with this guy, and you can do gromov with them theory, basically, I mean, holomorphic curve counting uh, on this uh, cylindrical symplectic manifold. That is non-compact in this vertical direction. So what you want to do is count counting holomorphic curves there. In context homology, in fact, you restrict to like a modular space of holomorphic curve that is like this. OK. On a contact manifold, you have the red vector field. The red vector field might have, in fact, has uh, periodic orbits. So let me put some circles here. But these are the periodic orbits of the red vector field. These are. OK, we want to restrict to the modular space of holomorphic uh, curves from P1 to these guys here. Um, so it's a modular space of holomorphic curves that has some, I mean, this is gamma, gamma 1, gamma s, a of v. So I tell you by in, in words what, it, what this guy is. Uh, it's uh, maps from P1 with punctures. And the punctures on the P1, on the sphere, goes to red orbits. You see, only one of them goes upstairs. And um, S of them, gamma 1, gamma S, reach red orbits downstairs. Okay. So this is gamma 1, gamma S. And uh, okay, this uh, S here in this case is 2. I mean, it doesn't have to reach all of the red orbits, of course. And the gamma is the guy upstairs. It's a holomorphic curve uh, with respect to this complex structure that you put, uh, almost complex structure that you put on the um, manifold uh, V times R. And uh, OK, it has uh, a degree, an homology class A. In, uh, so the, the curve represents the homology class. And the homology class uh, is an homology class of V, but of course it's relative to the rev orbits. So V, uh, let me put gamma, is the set of these red orbits that you have. <coughs> and uh, OK. OK, so these moduli spaces, if you want to work with them, they need to be compactified. First of all, notice one thing. Since in the target, uh, there is a vertical R direction and an action of, the, of R vertically, better it's better if we caution it out, otherwise we, we never reach compactness. Uh, and secondly, if we want to compactify, we have to add some strata. And uh, just to be quick, basically you have a codimension one phenomenon that you can observe. And it's like this. So you have the possibility uh, of um, multi-floor curves, meaning that you have uh, that the, the, the map degenerates vertically, and uh, and you have stacks of any number, in fact, of um, uh, of curves. And uh, but in codimension one, it happens that they are at most two. If you want to imagine, you can put like trivial cylinders where, uh, where the orbits do not match. What is important is that uh, on the boundary, you have the same kind of curves that, uh, that you find in the bulk of the moduli space. So only one positive uh, uh, rev orbit. And uh, at one of the negative rev orbits, I mean, one of the negative rev orbits coincide with, uh, with the only positive rev orbit of the downstairs curve. Uh, in order that when you glue back, you get uh, an element in the modular space uh, in the bulk. And uh, you would expect also to have, because uh, I mentioned two phenomenon, uh, like in gromov witten theory, uh, the typical bubble degeneration, or maybe even worse, like this. But this doesn't happen because. Because in this uh, cylindrical context, uh, there's the maximum principle that forbids you to have a maximum of the holomorphic curve. So this doesn't happen 
this never happens. What, at most, what can happen if you have market points here, of course, as in Global Within Theory, you can put also market points flying around in the curve. You can have ghost bubbles, like constant bubbles here. But, uh, okay, let me ignore this. Right? This, this uh, gives some structure to the theory, which is pretty nice. Uh, because uh, you can do this. You can, you can build a, poten a potential, like uh, in... Uh, like in gromo Wither theory. And it's uh, an integration over the moduli space, as you can imagine, that is now compactified. So did I put an R here? Yeah, yeah, by this R, I didn't explain, but it's the number of extra market points I want to put on the moduli space. OK, so we have gamma. Gamma 1, gamma s, a of v, not the r. And uh, it's as usual. You, you pull back classes from the target space. with the Novikov ring uh, uh, to separate the uh, curves uh, with different degrees. And uh, you, put, you need to put something new with respect to gramov in theory, which is extra variables q that encode the negative punctures, basically. And also, we encode the positive one with this symbol. So you see, each of these gammas appear here in the moduli space. The gamma here in the derivative that appears here. And the uh, R market points. And then, of course, the class T is a class in the cohomology of V. And you pull it back with evaluation maps. Uh, and A is the degree. OK. And this guy is not an invariant at all, because, uh, because the space has a boundary. So first of all, if you, if you Take an, ele an element in the homology, in the cohomology. Uh, I mean, uh, if it's, I mean, since there's a codimension one boundary, it just goes to the boundary, and so uh, two different representatives of the same cohomology class uh, give you different uh, numbers when you integrate on a space with boundary, right? It's a Stokes theorem, and. Uh, and in fact, uh, nothing is really an invariant because uh, in order to define these spaces, okay, this is the, the tricky part, but uh, you need to perturb the cauchy riemann equation and this perturbation uh, can destroy all of the invariants. So the numbers depend on the perturbations. And then uh, again, uh, you can uh, consider uh, another uh, contact one form that is contactomorphic to this one, and this changes the numbers. So but what is invariant is, in fact, uh, an homology that you can create with this guy. OK, first of all, let me say, OK, th th this construction, just to give credits, it's Eliasberg, Eventhal, and Hofer, and then was studied by many people. Eliasberg, Eventhal, Hofer, and then other like bourgeois. I don't know how I, I should cite, probably. Uh, like 20 people, but it comes originally from, from SFT. This is a special instance of, of SFT, in fact. OK, and uh, so yes, I was saying, uh, yeah, what is the invariant that we can extract from this guy? Uh, you, you have to work like this. Consider, consider, oh my god, consider an algebra. <laughs> uh, a, a graded the graded um, supercommutative algebra with unit uh, generated, freely generated by the red orbits by 
the rev orbit. So I want to use this, like formal variables q gamma as we did there. But I mean, it's the rev orbits, right? Uh, over the Novikov ring, C of H2 of V. In fact, there's a subtlety because uh, you need to select uh, only some of the rep orbits that are called good rep orbits that have, uh, that are well behaved with respect to a natural index that symplectic geometry puts on the on the on the orbits. But uh, I mean, let's ignore this uh, this subtlety. Okay. So it's super commutative. So I need to tell you something about the grading. Okay. The grading is that Q gamma is a grading, and uh, it's the conley zender index of the orbit gamma plus n minus 3 for some reason, where n is a, is it, a dimension of the manifold. And, uh, and also, we want to put uh, a grading for the, our other variable a, I mean, z, z to the a. And z to the a as grading churn class. And minus 2 churn class psi a. Yeah. OK. So in fact, to define these, you need to fix trivialization of the symplectic bundle ker lambda at the rev orbits. And this gives you both the conley zender index, that is, an index that uh, associate to a path of symplectic matrices, the loop, and uh, the relative churn class here. OK. And with this algebra, you can uh, see x as a differential acting on this algebra. So the point is that x now becomes like x on the, al on the algebra, okay. like, like a vector field, a differential operator. And uh, it squares to 0 because, uh, let me use this notation, I mean, it's like the, the, li the li li derivative of the vector field with itself is 0. This makes sense because with this grading, the guy here is always odd. So this is, in fact, uh, like twice the action of x composed the act with x. And this is 0 by, by the way the boundary of the moduli space is made of, you know, there's a boundary. And uh, we are just saying with this equation, it's algebraically, the algebraic translation of the fact that the boundary is formed by the same kind of curves that you have in the, in the bulk. So when you compose to curves, like a composition of the differential. You, you see the upper orbit saturates with one of the lower orbits when you apply it on itself. Uh, you get 0 because it's the boundary of the, uh, of the manifold. And it's oriented. And in the end, uh, you get 0 if you sum. Okay. So you can take homology. And this is the, the invariant that you get. This is contact to a model. By definition. OK? This is an invariant. OK, it's a, it's a theorem. Uh, it's proved by Elias Berg, and Hofer. And uh, yeah. So in this theory, I would like to plug this sentence. There's a, if you want a motivation for this, uh, let's say that you could consider the expansion of x in terms of t variables. In x, there are t variables, you see. x depends on t, z, and q. So you can expand x in t variables. Here you have a sum, alpha, t, uh, t alpha, uh, one of the t variables. 
plus order of t squared. And then uh, you have that uh, x alpha, just the coefficient uh, of uh, the linear part of um, x with respect to t variables, commutes with uh, x, x0, sorry. So this means that it's x, uh, that x alpha is an element in homology with a zero here. So yeah. this implies x alpha is in homology. And also that x alpha, x beta, is 0 as an element of the homology, again. Sure. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I, I was thinking about sympathetic field theory. You're right. There, there are operators, in fact, <coughs> on the homology. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, of course, because um, yeah, in fact, uh, you have the, the brackets. So it's, uh, this tells you that, uh, uh, that the operator x alpha that acts on chain level commutes with, uh, with homology. So uh, of course, it's a, it descends to homology, sorry. It's an operator on homology. Uh, and they commute as uh, yeah, operators on homology. If you want to act on an element of the homology equals zero in homology. Okay. So why is this a motivation for introducing this sentence? Because uh, See, we have vector fields, vector fields, commuting vector, vector fields on some in infinite dimensional manifold. And uh, this manifold would be the manifold uh, uh, with coordinates uh, q gamma. And there, there's infinite coordinates q gamma. And uh, we would like to to achieve a complete system uh, of uh, uh, of vector fields on this infinite dimensional manifold. But we, f if we only have a finite dimensional cohomology of the manifold V, we end up only with a finite number of vector field x alpha, meaning that alpha runs on a finite number of, uh, of values. And uh, descendants uh, can make the situation a little better, uh, as, as, as it happens in Gromov-Witten theory, in fact. OK, so let's define descendants on these moduli spaces. OK, so we, we had a full summer school of uh, Ramovitan theory. So I will not define uh, what is a tautological bundle on a modular space of curves. But uh, so we know that in this situation, we can uh, define a tautological bundle just the same way as it happens in uh, the usual uh, modular space of gramo witten theory. So we, you have, oh, okay. You have uh, the moduli space. In, in our case, is this special mod moduli space, but it's still a space of curves with market points. So there's a way to put a tautological bundle in it. We call it Li at the ith market point. 
But this moduli space has a boundary of codimension one. And this moduli space, somehow, it's a product of two copies of the same moduli space, of smaller, smaller versions of the same moduli space. By this equation, I just mean that at the boundary, you, can, you find, again, the same kind of objects, only you find two. Uh, so this means that uh, if the ith market points that, that what was here in the curve lands on one of these two <coughs> components, you also have Li on the smaller moduli space that composes the boundary, right? So if this map here is the projection on the first factor, here just in this uh, isomorphism, uh, you, can, uh, you have two, way, two ways to pull back bundles here on the boundary. And one is, of course, just P1 star of Li. And the other one is, if I call this map J, is like this. And because of the definition of the, mod of the tautological bundle is completely local at the market point, uh, they are just equal. Because, I mean, th th this, is, this follows from the definition of tautological bundle. Uh, now, the next step in Gromovitan theory is taking the churn class of these guys and using it for integrating uh, on the moduli space of curves, right? This is, this is what is, it's a bit tricky here because you have boundaries, so what's the churn class? So instead of doing this, you need to consider, so instead of taking, if you want, the Poincare dual to C1 of Li, as you would do in Gromov Witten theory, and this is submoduli space of, of M. This you, you cannot do, but still, so this doesn't work. But still, you can choose uh, some sections. And you can relate the sections of the bundles like this. Uh, so Si. Uh, OK, let me choose. Si on each moduli space such that, in such a way that Si to the minus, uh, yeah, even better pi star 1 of S i prime. Let me put the prime here so that equals um, j star of S i. So what I'm telling you is that that you need to choose sections for this uh, moduli space uh, in such a way that they are compatible at the boundary. Uh, when you reach the boundary, the section coincides with the section that you chose for uh, the, the smaller moduli space uh, uh, constituting the boundary. Of course, again, this is a, uh, uh, there are lots of choices like this. Ah, by the way, this can always be done in the smooth world. Not, of course, in the holomorphic wor world or anything. But in the smooth world, there's always a way to extend a section from the boundary of a manifold to the full manifold. Uh, uh, so you have uh, some number of mark points. Yeah. And that mark point can split into two between the boundary. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. You have some number of mark points. And uh, when you reach the boundary, they split. Like and one, I mean, you consider the other market point that you want to consider the tautological. Uh, if it goes upstairs, you pull back from upstairs. Otherwise, you pull back from downstairs. And, uh, and then when you choose sections, you have to do it compatibly with this, uh, with this, mm, with this splitting. There are a lot of choices that are compatible, but uh, you know, the theory itself. Uh, is using representatives. And then it's the homology that will be an invariant. And this choice here, this compatibility condition, is precisely the, 
the right one that gives you that gives you an homology that is still an invariant and doesn't depend on the choice of the sections anymore. If you want to see details on this, you have to look at uh, Oliver's paper. So let me put Fabert. It's a sort of construction that was already made uh, in trying to define the moduli space themselves uh, using obstruction bundles. With obstruction bundles, you find the same kind of problem. Okay. Uh, now, using descendants, uh, you can uh, have your. So let's make this choice. This cuts some zeros of this special choice of sections. So you have. Uh, Submodulized spaces given by the zeros of these sections, and uh, just by working as Ingram or Witten theory, this gives you an enriched differential t uh, uh, x depending on t z and q. But now there are much more t variables because you have an, an extra index that counts the number of uh, um, counts. Uh, yeah, the number of sections you use to, to cut zeros, in particular, you, you, you use the intersection uh, of all of these sections. But this is like in gromov witten theory, right? Uh, yeah, what I mean is that now T stands for something with two indices. And alpha runs from 1 to the dimension of the cohomology of the target manifold while p runs from 0 to, uh, well, I mean to infinity. To <coughs> and precisely counts uh, the number of sections that you use, so how much you cut down the dimension of the moduli space using zeros of sections. But all of them must be transversal, so you have to make uh, a number of choices, because you have to choose uh, many representatives uh, of this uh, compatible section and then consider the intersection of all of them. And this drops the dimension in the moduli space, right? OK. This means that you have a differential depending on an, an infinite number of uh, t variables. So when you do these constructions now, here alpha and beta now are called alpha p and beta uh, q. So you have an infinite number of, uh, of these uh, vector, uh, vectors on your infinite dimensional algebra. Okay. Now. Okay, but this is definitions. And of course, the proof that uh, you still get invariance with the choice. Uh, now you would like to be able to compute these uh, extra vector fields that you put on this theory. And uh, so what you do in this case in gromov witten theory? In gromov witten theory, in, a good si in good situations, you can use topological recursion relations to get the, the descendants from the primaries, so together with string, dilaton, and divisor equations. So you know, topological recursion relations come from a phenomenon in the moduli spaces that tells you that the Poincaré dual to the churn class of the line bundle Li on a moduli space has an expression in terms of uh, in this genus zero situation at least. Uh, in terms of uh, the locus of nodal objects in the moduli space in particular. This is the sum of divisors in the moduli space of um, uh, maps uh, in gromov witten theory. But I denote like this.
and uh, okay, this is uh, uh, in uh, m bar r r a of some target uh, closed symplectic manifold, and uh, this divisor is the divisors the divisor of nodal object. This is the divisor of nodal object where the ith market point is one component and two extra points on, are on another component, qr. Uh, I'm not completely sure who, who discovered this first. Uh, no, probably. Uh, I, mean, see, I read it uh, on a paper by Gatzler, but I guess that this is dates back to uh, Konsevich and Manin, I guess. Uh, So you see, if you want to express the, the locus uh, cut by the ith descendant, you have to make an, uh, some extra choice. So you have to select two market points uh, uh, with the uh, numbering p and r, or q and r, in fact. <laughs> and uh, you have to consider the divisor inside the moduli space of maps uh, formed by nodal curves. Uh, where Q and R are away from I, where I was the index here. So uh, yeah, it's a, it's a non-symmetric thing because uh, on the left-hand side uh, you, you, have a, um, uh, you have no dependence on Q and R, and on the right-hand side you do. But this works in remove within theory because the space, is, uh, the space uh, has no boundary and all of the choices are homologically equivalent, cohomologically equivalent, so, or homologically equivalent in this language. Uh, this is not the case uh, in uh, in our situation. Find an analog formula which is compatible with the, uh, how to say, coherence, boundary coherence. So the problem of this formula in our situation is that we have an extra constraint on these sections that we choose because we want the section to be boundary coherent as I explained to you before. And that formula just doesn't work. And it's easy to see, I mean, this is not symmetric. And boundary coherence in particular requires symmetry because uh, every time you drop at the boundary you can have uh, uh, the same copy of the of the same uh, I mean a copy of the same moduli space in different uh, uh, instances uh, of boundary I mean different components of uh, of the boundary uh, of the same moduli space in particular uh, some of them can be uh, the same moduli space up to permutation of the market points and uh, this permutation of the market points is precisely what, uh, uh, what this formula is not symmetric uh, uh, up to, right? So, solution, I don't want to bother you too much, but uh, I mean, you can prove that uh, it's actually sufficient to take the average of that formula. <coughs> so that, that, that the easiest guess that you can make uh, actually works. So, in particular, uh, symmetrize and you have that in our situation, 
Well, there are many instances because there are many ways to symmetrize since we have two kind of market points. This. Yeah, Q. Thanks. Q minus one. Q minus one. All right, zero equals sum P2. Uh, sorry, Q. Q2. Q2 minus one. Over two, d tilde. Uh, I am gamma j gamma one gamma two. Okay, this is us. So. So, you make your choice of coherent sections, and if you want to study the zeros, so a, per, a special instance of choice, you, you remember we have the possibility of making different choices, all of them must be coherent. So a coherent choice, coherent at the boundary, you mean, uh, is that uh, you take just that formula there and you average with respect to the choices of Q and R. Okay, in this formula that I write here, in particular, I'm averaging uh, with respect to the choice of um, uh, of punctures, so in our situation, the points Q and R can be either market points or punctures because we have two kind of um, points of the on the curves on the curve, and uh, in particular, since uh, coherence uh, is something that. Uh, um, is only about uh, punctures, in fact, uh, because uh, it's uh, this uh, codimension one splitting. You want to have coherent, uh, you want to, um, where you want to mm, impose coherence. So it's enough to average with respect of choices of punctures, Q and R, in that the blackboard down there. So Q, big Q, is the number of punctures that you have on the moduli space. So this is a formula for a moduli space. Uh, so this operator here just counts the number, number of punctures, and you see it's just the number of choices of two punctures inside a, a space with the Q punctures. And um, okay, and uh, when I write Q2 here, I mean to count uh, the number of punctures that appear in the second component. So. Again, you have this situation here, I here, and you have two punctures on the second component. So you have n punctures on the second component. And the, this just counts the number of ways of choosing two of them on the second component. So Q2 is the number of punctures here. Uh, but then now, what is this divisor? This divisor is, yeah, again, it's, uh, it's a divisor of, uh, in the boundary, so of boundary objects. Uh, but in fact, uh, you know, in, uh, in this situation of contact homology, as I told you, uh, in what you have is not a nodal configuration in the boundary, but it's a two-floor configuration. So let me draw it like this. Okay. And what is mm, somewhat uh, um, intriguing is that uh, this is called dimension one, while of course uh, the zeros of a section of a complex line bundle, as we want, is called dimension one, uh, two. Sorry. Real codimension two, I mean. So we need to cut something inside the, the boundary of such objects, and it turns out that the right thing to do is it somehow to force uh, the identification of the two circles to 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 be at a given uh, angle. Okay, this is in words what. So the tilde up. Up here means fix theta, where theta is this parameter here, this freedom of attaching the two curves in a codimension one situation. And this is a bit uh, annoying because uh, contact homology, as I explained it before, just is oblivious of this theta. There is no parameter in the potential that <coughs> controls the angle at which you glue to, to, to such objects. Uh, so what to do with this formula? 
if, uh, if I cannot use it for the potential, because the potential cannot fix this guy here. Uh, well, the point is that uh, you have to enrich a bit, li little bit the, th the theory itself. And here is the thing. So now applications. Applications of this formula. There are two. First one is cylindrical contact homology. OK, non-equivalent. Cylindrical contact homology. And this is something that was done by Bourgeois and Orange. So imagine you have no disks, no holomorphic disks. Okay, you, are, you choose a target V, a, a, a target contact manifold that doesn't allow for uh, the disks uh, bounded by Reb orbits. Bounded by Reb orbits to appear. Hmm? Okay, then the theory as a natural and simpler somehow restriction. So contact homology can be restricted to just cylinders, just counting cylinders instead of configuration that, are, that have multiple negative ends. This is because uh, if you consider a modular space of such objects, uh, the degeneration that creates a, a f another uh, negative end cannot appear because you are forbidding disks. So this cannot appear. And you can forget about higher curves, and you just count cylinders. Then cylindrical contact homology is well defined. And you can also create a non-equivalent version. So the, the idea of non-equivalent contact homology is that you count, actually, so it's that you don't quotient out the S1 symmetry in this curve. So you remember your curve as S1 times R, and you remember the S1 coordinates. You don't quotient it out in the source of the map. So this gives you, in particular, a theta equals to 0 line. In, uh, theta is the angle of, on the cylinder. And you see, I mean, this theory is precisely what you need if you want to control this. Of course, uh, it's much simpler, but OK. Uh, so now the differential, in order to be it to be rich, <laughs> uh, okay, sorry. So now the complex, yeah, what I call CC for, for cylindrical. This is nothing to do with uh, oxygen homology. Uh, is two copies of the complex we had before, formed by uh, generated by Q gammas. Both of them. It's just two copies, but one I call check and one I call hat. And the, the degree is just shifted by one. And what, I mean, what it means, it becomes clear in a moment when I describe the differential. The differential on this complex is, is uh, um, constructed by counting cylinders that connect uh, gamma 1 with gamma 2 in the target manifold. And it has many components. The first one that goes from C hat to C hat is the usual one. But this, uh, OK, the usual one just means that uh, you count cylinders uh, that are asymptotic to gamma 1 and gamma 2. But since you are not quotienting out the S1 symmetry, this dies because uh, there's always an S1 symmetry that you never fix. So and this is equal to 0. Maybe you should, uh, oh, OK. Then you have the other instances from head to check. And you count cylinders such that the theta equals to 0 line is constrained. Uh, on a point that you have to fix on gamma 1. Gamma 1 is the upper orbit. So I'm saying when you consider the Reb orbits, there's a special point that fixed. And you count only those cylinders for which the theta equals to 0 line goes to that point. This fixes this one symmetry and gives you a finite number of, of guys. A 
and then there are from C hat to C check. It's the same, but uh, now you use gamma two. And of course, as you can imagine, they are pretty the same, guy, okay? <laughs> because it's it's the same thing that you fix it from below or from above this line. And there's then a richer uh, differential that counts cylinders that are constrained. So theta equals to zero, constrained uh, on a on a point, fixed point on gamma one and the gamma 2. And this is like a lower dimensional moduli space. So sometimes the map is uh, non-rigid enough to find the right map that uh, makes this point coincide with the lower point through the line theta equals to 0. OK. You construct uh, Okay, the non-equivalent cylindrical contact homology, as you can imagine. Cylindrical contact homology, non -ec. of V. It's just the homology, well, <laughs> homology of C, complex, and C, C star, uh, with respect to this differential here. And now you can consider a differential with a market point and with a descendant. So you can also consider, let me just draw a picture very quick, an object that counts cylinders with a market point constrained to the class alpha and with the pth descendant. Hmm? Just like this. But uh, I claim that I can make this an operator going uh, uh, around this complex. So it's from C to C, C, C. <laughs> because again, I can constrain, I can leave the, 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 the cylinder as it is. Uh, or I can constrain the market point along the vertical line to lie on a point to, to hit a point above, to hit a point below, or to hit a point on both sides. OK? It's like having a line, only you have a point in this case. So this, the S1 symmetry is quotiented out, but then you put a point and you recover the S1 symmetry, and then you, so it's almost the same thing, right? Uh, only, I mean, it's very easy to check that these guys become operators on this homology. So alpha p. And delta and del, they commute. This is just uh, easy studying the boundary of such objects. Hmm? Okay. I'm almost done. Almost in time, by the way. Yeah, of course, I mean, let me write it here. I mean, this just means that the alpha p is an operator on homology, cylindrical, cylindrical contact homology. Ah, OK, here I should ah, okay. put it non-equivalent. Uh, by the way, of course, this guy here squares to 0. And, uh, and for this, the, uh, the, the, these operators, you can write some equations. So this is uh, well, if you want theorem. Yeah. 
and you also have this. Okay. There's also a third one, but I don't want to write it now. Uh, okay. So by using the result we had before, also an enriched version that also counts the market points, you can write uh, these two equations that produce uh, higher descendants using lower descendants. So in particular, using the zeroth one here and the p pi p minus 1 here, you produce the pth descendant of these operators. And now, this n is the operator that counts the number of mar extra market points that you are not constraining in case, in case you have them. So of course, you can put extra market points in this theory, both here and here. And you just use it as, as usual. So this just counts that number. What is this f? This f is uh, like the, uh, it's actually, it's the potential of constant curves in this case of contact homology. This theory, uh, so w when the target is contact, as we said, that, that there are no bubbles with no ends. So in fact, uh, only constant curves can appear as in this bubbling uh, side of the formula. Anyway, OK, I it's just uh, the potential for uh, uh, constant uh, curves to the target. Uh, this, is, this eta, of course, is the uh, Poincaré pairing. Uh, in H star of V. And uh, this n, again, counts the number of market points. Mm, this is nothing else that, yeah. Uh, okay, I think uh, that's all. I explained all, all of the terms. In fact, this theory also works when the target is non-contact, but just what is called a stable Hamiltonian structure. And in that more little more gener um, general situation, uh, the, the potential of curves with no punctures can be non-trivial, in fact. So it, this formula also works for a little more um, general case that has half uh, to, to also count non-constant curves. Uh, so, okay, this is an instance of uh, like reconstructing higher descendant from lower one. And okay, there was another application, but I have no time. So let me just conclude by using these two formulas to prove a little result in uh, non-equivalent contact homology. If I find it. I don't. Ah, okay. So I want to define an action the quantum cohomology Okay, by this quantum cohomology, in this contact case, it just means the, put, uh, the, the, the structure that you get from the potential of constant curves in the target. So the structure that you get, the solution to WDVV equations that you get uh, uh, when you consider constant curves in the target. But in, in the st stable Hamiltonian structure example, this can also be more uh, like interesting. Uh, and the action is just like a class here. 
take an element of the um, uh, chain complex, and this is mapped just to the differential alpha 0 q. Uh, yeah, this. Or, same thing, take a class here, take another, uh, another um, generator of the complex, and this is mapped uh, to alpha 0 q check gamma. Uh, OK. Then, uh, this is an action. of QH star of V on con meaning that's a, of course I mean uh, it's an action so <laughs> the product here is compatible with the uh, with this map and uh, I mean, the proof is in completely immediate. Uh, you just look at these two equations. You consider the case. Let me check. OK. Let me write it in one line. equals to 1, j equals to 0. Okay, if you do this computation, where TRR1 is this guy, and TRR2 is this other guy, you get directly the equation that tells you that, uh, that the, the product here commutes with the, with the map and intertwines the map so that you get an action. And uh, yeah, since I'm late, I think uh, I will stop here. Yeah, the point is that okay, the other okay, th this case of course is just cylindrical contact homology, and uh, what happens is that, uh, in fact, this approach. I mean, w what did we do? We enriched the theory with extra uh, operators, uh, and then I'm telling you, okay, now that I define it, I can also compute it uh, from the theory without these operators. So, I mean, what's the point? You can you can ask, because. Uh, we enriched the theory, and then we proved that uh, we can compute what we what, in, what we invented, <laughs> in fact, right? S yeah. Okay. In, in this in this example, uh, I agree. <laughs> but uh, the point is that this uh, this approach extend, uh, extends to um, uh, contact homology, and in fact ex extends also to symplectic field theory, even if you have to modify the theory a little bit. Uh, and in that situation, being able to have uh, these extra operators actually allows you to, uh, to use the, the, the power of, uh, uh, of integrable systems, uh, or at least uh, symmetric Hamiltonian systems, uh, to, um, uh, to, to actually mm, make computa computations. For instance, you, can, you, know, you can use symplectic field theory to compute gram with an invariance, because symplectic field theory has a topological uh, field theory approach to gram with an invariance. It's like a, relative Gromov-Witten theory. You can split the Gromov-Witten invariance into pieces, uh, or, um, or the target, in fact, the target space into pieces. You compute the Gromov-Witten invariance, uh, relative Gromov-Witten invariance of the single pieces, and then you glue back. And symplectic field theory can do the same with target symplectic manifolds. 
And, uh, but the procedure, the computational procedure that generates the, the invariance for the glued manifold uh, involves, uh, a a compute involves uh, using these, uh, uh, these uh, Hamiltonian systems. And since, uh, in particular, involves uh, solving the Hamilton Jacobi equation for, the, for these uh, Hamiltonian systems. And as you know, if you have an Hamiltonian system and you impose the Hamilton Jacobi equation for an Hamiltonian in order to solve it, you have to look for symmetries of that Hamiltonians. And uh, what we claim, I mean, I mean, it's not us. This is originally in simple field theory. These extra operators are the symmetries you need for the computations. And now, you see, it's useful to have a way to compute them recursively. And uh, in particular, these guys here for uh, uh, S1 bundles over symplectic manifold completely recover uh, Dubrovin's integrable systems for Gromov-Witten theory. <coughs> 